Revelation chapter 14 to 15. Chapter 14. This chapter tells of the destruction of the wicked in Jerusalem, so that Jesus and saved Israel may dwell there in the millennial reign. In verses 1 to 5, the world is given clear evidence that the Lord is God over all. In verses 6 to 7, those who have not believed the gospel of the kingdom and have not taken the mark of the beast or worshipped his image are given the opportunity to believe the everlasting gospel so that they may be part of God's kingdom on earth. They are reminded in verse 8 that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, so that they know not to trust in the Antichrist and his kingdom. In verses 9 to 11, they are told that those who have taken the mark or worship the image do not have this kingdom offer. Then in verses 14 to 20, Jesus gathers up the wicked and destroys them outside of Jerusalem, so that Jerusalem is purified for God and saved Israel to dwell in together, when God marries the land, Isaiah 62 verse 4, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, 19 colon 7 dash 9. Chapter 14 colon 1, in chapter 4, John saw the throne room of heaven. God showed him this before he showed him the events of the tribulation period, so that John would understand that the tribulation period is necessary in order to maintain God's holiness, and to bring God's holiness to his entire universe. Then in chapter 7, God sealed 144,000 to show that the believing remnant will make it through the tribulation period. In chapter 13, we saw the great, false religion of Babylon that Satan perpetrates through the Antichrist, and how Satan takes over the entire world by it. After reading chapter 13, the natural question would be, what happened to God's people? Is God powerful enough to preserve all of his people through Satan's greatest attack upon mankind? The answer to the latter question is an emphatic yes. The answer is given in 14 colon 1, where the 144,000, sealed at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, are seen standing, at the end of the Great Tribulation, with the Lamb on top of Mount Shaun. This is Jesus' second coming. This event is spoken of in Zechariah 14 verse 4, when the Lord pours out his wrath upon all those joined to the Antichrist, who have gathered, on the false trinity's side, to battle against the Lord Jesus Christ and his forces, see 16 12 16. Apostate Israel should take heart and have faith that God will deliver them from Satan and bring them into God's eternal kingdom on earth, if they repent, by putting themselves back under the law covenant and by not worshipping the image or taking the mark of the beast. We should note that Hebrews 12 verses 22 to 29 gives additional information to this verse. There we are told that Israel is come unto Mount Shaun, and to Jesus. If they refuse the blood of the new covenant, they will receive the eternal, consuming fire of God, being aligned with the Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon. However, if they accept the blood of Jesus by believing the gospel of the kingdom, rather than being subject to God's wrath, they will get to stand with the Lamb on Mount Shaun, 14 colon 1, assuring a place for them in God's eternal kingdom on earth. Chapter 14 colon 2 the voice from heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking what is in 14 colon 4 dash 5 as the judge, John 5 verse 22, Revelation 20 verse 4. The voice of many waters signals the Holy Ghost's power, since he is the living water, John 7 verses 38 to 39. The voice of a great thunder is the voice of God the Father, since his voice thundered when he spoke from heaven, John 12 verses 27 to 29. The voice of harpers would be the sealed 144,000, as explained in chapter 14 colon 3. People usually associate harpers with angels. However, Revelation 5 verse 8 says that the 24 elders have harps, and they are redeemed men, as we mentioned in the notes there. In fact, angels never play harps in the Bible. Pretty much everything that churchianity says about angels is wrong. Therefore, this voice from heaven is the entire Godhead, God the Father thundering, God the Son, through the 144,000 redeemed by his blood, harping, and God the Holy Ghost providing the water sound. Together, the voice in this verse shows God's power to execute judgment, bring salvation to believers, and sanctify them so that they will live forever in God's kingdom, overcoming Satan and his forces. Chapter 14 colon 3, After God delivered Israel through the Red Sea, Israel sang a song, Exodus 15, which was praise to God for his deliverance. No other group of saved people can sing this song, because it is only true of those saved through the Red Sea. 
Similarly, the sealed 144,000 Jews were protected from the devil during the Great Tribulation, chapter 12 colon 13-16, like no other group. Therefore they sing a new song that pertains specifically to God's deliverance of them, which is why they are the only ones able to learn this song. Think of it like a graduation song. Only those graduating are worthy to sing it. Also, note that the 14400 were redeemed from the earth. This supports the doctrine that Satan is the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Otherwise, if God is the god of this world, believers in God would not have to be redeemed from the earth. Chapter 14 colon 4, now, we get an explanation of how God figured out who would be the 144,000 that he will seal in order to get them safely through the great tribulation. They made the free will decision to change their mind, repent, and abandon the Jewish religion and trust in God to give them eternal life as he promised to do under the law covenant. In spiritual terms, this means that they did not defile themselves with the false religion of the Antichrist, which is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, chapter 17, colon 5. Therefore they are not spiritually defiled with women, making them spiritual virgins. Since they are spiritual virgins, this does not mean that they are all men who have never had physical sex before. They may or may not be married in the flesh. Spiritually though, where it counts, they have kept themselves from being defiled by false religion, so that they will remain virgins until the marriage supper of the Lamb, being espoused to Christ, chapter 19, colon 9. This group, then, includes both men and women. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3 verse 28. We see that they stay pure by following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, chapter 14, colon 4, and it is this following that makes them spiritual virgins. In other words, they listen to his voice, as found in the word of God rightly divided, and follow him, as John 10 verses 4 to 5 says they will do. Because of their faith in God's law covenant with them, then, God redeems them, halfway through the tribulation period, by sealing them, chapter 7. As discussed previously, they are still on the earth to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 6 to 8, during the last half of the tribulation period. Therefore, when this verse says that they were redeemed from among men halfway through the tribulation period, it means that they already have eternal life because they have been sealed. It does not mean that they are taken off of the earth at this time. However, because they are redeemed with their sealing, this makes them first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, chapter 14, colon 4. Second fruits, if you will, will be the rest of Israel that believes during the last half of the tribulation period. Chapter 14, colon 5, because they are born of the Spirit, John 3, verse 5, there is no guile in them. Having no guile means that they are not double-minded, James 1, colon 8, for colon 8. In other words, they are not following religion. In John 1, verse 47, we see Jesus identify the apostle Nathanael as an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Jesus identified him as such when he was under the fig tree, John 1, verse 48. A fig tree, in the Bible, is symbolic of religion, as seen when Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together to try to cover their sin, Genesis 3 verse 7. When Jesus saw Nathanael under Israel's religious system, but not believing it, he recognized him as part of the believing remnant. Similarly, when Jesus sees the 144,000 in apostate Israel's religious system during the first half of the tribulation period, he also sees that they do not believe that false religious system of Babylon. Therefore he seals them before the beginning of the great tribulation, which makes them without fault before the throne of God, chapter 14, colon 5. Chapter 14, colon 6-7, when the false prophet sets up the image of the beast in the temple, there is probably a worldwide, internet broadcast of the message that all must worship the beast or be killed and take the mark of the beast or lose all of their money. Since worshipping the beast and or taking the mark seals someone's doom in the lake of fire, chapter 14 colon 9-11, God sends an angel with the everlasting gospel to the Gentiles so that they may enter the kingdom. This gospel is to fear God and give glory to him, and worship him that made heaven, and earth chapter 14 colon 7. It is called the everlasting gospel, because every person, 
who has ever been born, intrinsically knows of God's eternal power and Godhead, Romans 1 verses 19 to 20 and John 1 verse 9. Therefore, if no other gospel is presented to a person, he can at least be saved by believing the everlasting gospel. This destroys the argument that people make today that, we must go to all nations with the gospel or else they will not be able to be saved. In fact, most missionary activity makes things worse because they preach a false gospel. Then, when people believe this false gospel, they are made twofold more the child of hell than those preaching it, Matthew 23 verse 15. Of course, such a verse would never be preached in a Christian church today, because the leaders can raise a lot more money in their churches if they get the people to rally behind the cause of missionaries. Then, they can send people to the mission field, which really amounts to a paid vacation to an exotic country, and the leaders can skim money from the top to pad their own salaries. Today, instead of being missionaries, we are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, living out the gospel of Philippians 2 verses 12 to 15, in a world that needs it, 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 10. This lifestyle evangelism is a much more effective tool than going to a foreign country, trying to communicate the gospel in a non-native tongue, and expecting people to believe what a complete stranger says. You may say, what about Jesus' statement that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come? Matthew 24 verse 14 Jesus was sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24, and he sent his disciples unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6. However, because Israel is scattered among the nations during the at-hand phase of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world, so that all of the lost sheep of Israel are saved, Romans 11 verse 26. Therefore, rather than being a statement to reach all people groups with the gospel, as churchianity would have you believe, Matthew 24 verse 14 is really saying that the believing remnant of Israel must preach the kingdom gospel to all nations in order for all of Israel to be saved. Since God's people today are the body of Christ, and not the nation of Israel, we need not travel to other nations to try to get people saved. Getting back to the tribulation period, the angel's message of chapter 14 6 7 is to Gentiles to follow the everlasting gospel, instead of bowing down to the image or taking the mark of the beast. As such, this angel, preaching the everlasting gospel, probably comes just before the false prophet institutes worship of the image of the beast so that God is just in giving the whole world a chance to believe the gospel and be saved before sealing their eternal destiny in the lake of fire by taking the mark or worshiping the image. Note that, at Jesus' second coming, the unbelievers know exactly who they are rejecting, as they say, Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Chapter 6 colon 16-17 Therefore, unbelieving Gentiles are without excuse, Romans 1 verse 20. Chapter 14 colon 8 The whole world had trusted in Babylon for the three and a half years of the great tribulation. Now Babylon is fallen, is fallen, chapter 14 colon 8. This proves that God is the all-powerful one, not Satan. If people do not worship God at this point, they will never worship him. The reason is fallen, is said twice is once for the Babylonian religious systems fall chapter 17 colon 1 dash 6, and once for the Babylonian economic systems fall chapter 18 colon 11 dash 19, that both work together to get people to sell their souls to the devil. The reason she is fallen is, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, chapter 14 colon 8. We see this also in chapter 17 colon 1 dash 2, and in chapter 18 colon 3. In other words, her false, religious system causes all participating in it to worship Satan instead of God. That is the fornication, which is packaged in the wine of her economic system. The way Babylon causes the nations to commit this fornication is by tying food, water, and all economic transactions to it. Thus we see the economic and the religious system work together, and both is fallen. The first angel declares the everlasting gospel, chapter 14 colon 6 dash 7, the second angel says that Babylon is fallen, chapter 14 colon 8, and the third angel says that you cannot be saved if you worship the image or take the mark of the beast, chapter 14 colon 9 dash 11. While the first and third angel's messages make sense halfway through the tribulation period, 
the second angel's message does not make sense until the end of the tribulation period, when Babylon really, is fallen, is fallen chapter 18 colon 2. However, as we have already learned in the Revelation notes, God, calleth those things which be not as though they were Romans for verse 17. The reason God does this is to show the world that God will destroy Babylon. Therefore, they should not put their trust in the unholy trinity. In other words, if you believe the internal witness of God that you are a sinner, you will believe the everlasting gospel first angel, recognize that man's kingdoms are only temporary second angel, and not align yourself with the antichrist's kingdom third angel. Thus, the three angels speak a progression that takes place in someone who becomes a believer, rather than speaking of things in chronological order. This is necessary, at this time, to keep the lost sheep of the house of Israel from sealing their eternity in the lake of fire by taking the mark, or worshipping the image of the beast. Chapter 14 colon 9-11, in 14 1-5, the whole world sees who is the true God. In 14 colon 6-7, they are given the opportunity to align themselves with the true God. In chapter 14 colon 8, they find out that Satan's kingdom will fall. Now in chapter 14 colon 9-11, they find out that those, who align themselves with Satan's kingdom, by worshipping his image, or by taking his mark, are going to burn forever in the lake of fire. We need to keep in mind that the three proclamations of chapter 14 colon 6-11, do not come from some preacher or even from the two witnesses. Rather, they come from angels flying in heaven. The first and third proclamations are said, with a loud voice chapters 14 colon 7, 9. This, coupled with the everlasting gospel being preached to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people chapter 14 colon 6, leads me to believe that all people on the earth hear these proclamations. Considering that they come from heaven, this should make the Gentiles' decision to follow the everlasting gospel an easy one. The nations drank of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, chapter 14, colon 8, which means, as a group, they receive God's wrath for apostasy. In chapter 14, colon 9, we are told that individuals who committed this fornication are included in receiving the eternal wrath of God for their apostasy as well. This is God's pure wrath, since it is poured out upon them, without mixture, chapter 14, 10. They are tormented with fire and brimstone, chapter 14, 10, and there is smoke of their torment, chapter 14, 11. This means that those, in the lake of fire, literally burn for eternity. They have no rest day nor night, chapter 14, 11, means that they never stop burning. Isaiah 66 verse 24 says, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. This means that their flesh is burned down to a worm, and it stays in this state for all eternity, while they are tormented forever with fire and brimstone. Jesus reinforced this idea by quoting Isaiah 66 verse 24 in Mark 9 verses 44 and 46 and 48. Their having no rest is in contrast to saved Israel. For them, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God Hebrews 4 verse 9. The bottom line is that the majority of the world will give up eternal rest in God for a three and a half year rest in Satan. They do so, as 14.11 says, by worshipping the beast and his image and by receiving the mark of his name. Now, when chapter 14.10 says that those, in the lake of fire, will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, it does not mean that Jesus and the angels will be in the lake of fire with them. After all, what makes the punishment so bad is the absence of God's love in the lake of fire. The issue here is that God made men to live forever, and there is no way to escape being in God's presence. This is why Psalm 139 verse 8 says, If I make my bed in hell, behold thou the Lord art there. If God were to allow everyone to live in his kingdom, they would ruin his ability to show his love and the exceeding riches of his grace, in the ages to come, Ephesians 2 verse 7. Therefore, God has to consume the wickedness of men with fire. Isaiah 30 verse 33 says that God has made hell deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood, the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. This is why Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. Thus, fire comes from God to those in hell to keep them from ruining God's love being shown upon believers for all eternity. This is why those who take the mark of the beast or worship his image 
shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, chapter 14, 10. Apparently, there is the ability for men in God's earthly kingdom to see into hell. Isaiah 66 verse 24 says that those who come to Jerusalem to worship God can see the burning and torment of those in the lake of fire. Since they are coming to Jerusalem to the Lamb's throne, and the ability to see into hell is there, those, in the lake of fire, are tormented in the presence of the Lamb. They are also tormented in the presence of the holy angels, since angels surround God's throne. Therefore, part of the torment in the lake of fire is utter embarrassment from having the Lamb, the angels, and worshippers of God all see them burning with fire and being reduced to mere worms. Chapter 14 colon 12 Patience is necessary for the believing remnant to continue to have faith in God, in spite of the whole world following after the Antichrist, and the resulting persecution upon the believing remnant. These saints keep the commandments of God, chapter 14 12, by having the faith of Jesus, chapter 14 12. The faith of Jesus is seen in that he had faith in the Father's plan, even to his own death. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus, endured the cross, despising the shame, Hebrews 12 verse 2. Similarly, for the joy that is set before the believing remnant, they will despise the shame brought on them by the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. These saints demonstrate the in Christ life by believing that God will give them eternal life in God's kingdom, even if it means, as it did with Jesus, that they have to give their lives for the faith. Chapter 14 colon 13 since the false prophet has the power to cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed chapter 13 15, many Jews, who become believers during the Great Tribulation, will be slain chapter 6 colon 9-11. They are given the promise, here, that they will be blessed by God in his eternal, earthly kingdom, as a result. Their blessings are expounded upon, by the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew 5 verses 3 to 12, example, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Their works, following them into the kingdom, show how important it is to live for God during the Great Tribulation, because only saved souls and their works of faith will survive God's judgment at Christ's second coming. According to Matthew 5 verse 16, the believing remnant's good works cause men to glory God the Father. Of course, this does not happen during the Tribulation period. Rather, the glory goes to God at the great white throne judgment, when, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father Philippians 2 verse 11. Jesus Christ's lordship status is seen by the whole world due, in part, to how he is able to save and transform the lives of the believing remnant in the tribulation period, 1 Peter 2 verses 9 to 12, in spite of Satan ruling the world through the Antichrist and the false prophet. By the way, the henceforth of this verse begins at the time when the image and the mark of the beast are set up and capital punishment is established by the Antichrist. That is not to say that those who die in Christ before that time are not blessed. It is just that those who die afterward receive a special blessing due to the special persecution they endure. Chapter 14 colon 14 In 113, the Lord Jesus Christ is described as being one like unto the Son of Man. Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man in Matthew John, because most of what he did was as the Son of Man or the second Adam. After his resurrection from the dead, he received his glorified body. The disciples had trouble recognizing him because of his new body. Because he already has his new body in Revelation, he is referred to as being like unto the Son of Man. His humanity is emphasized here in chapter 14 14 to show that it is only as fully perfected men that he can execute judgment upon mankind, as the book of Hebrews explains. God is judge himself, Psalm 50 verse 6, due to God being the possessor of heaven and earth, Genesis 14 verse 22. At the same time, since all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23, God needs to exhibit mercy and grace or else no one would be saved. Being fully men, in addition to being fully God, then, makes the Lord Jesus Christ the perfect judge of mankind. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15. He has a golden crown, representing his conquering death, and hell, chapter 118, 
which gives him the power to use the sharp sickle in his hand to reap the earth clean of wickedness. Chapter 14, 15 15-16, Since Jesus is in his capacity as the perfect man, here, he is a little lower than the angels, Hebrews 2 verse 7, which is why he obeys a command from an angel. Of course, Jesus is also God. As God, he is the one who gave the commandment to the angel, who then passed it on to Jesus as man. Are you confused yet? The command is to reap the clusters of grapes from the vine of the earth, chapter 14, 18, because the harvest of the earth is ripe, chapter 14, 15, meaning that the height of men has been achieved as signaled by 666, being the number of the name of the beast, chapter 13, 18. The vine, in the Bible, represents man's fall, as men fell by eating the fruit of the vine of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the vine can also represent life in Christ, as in Isaiah 5 verse 7, where God has Israel as his vineyard. In John 15 verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. What this means is that all of mankind is either in the vine of Adam or the vine of Christ. Thanks to the rule of the Antichrist, the vine of the earth is prospering and in full fruit. Jesus comes and reaps the grapes off of this vine. This is described in Matthew 24 verses 36 to 44 and Luke 17 verses 34 to 37. The question is asked, where, Lord, are you taking them? The answer is, wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together, Luke 17 verse 37. Revelation 19 verses 17 to 18 has the fowls gathered, together unto the supper of the great God, in order to eat the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. The ones who are eaten, are the ones who gather together with the unholy trinity to make war with the Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 19, 19-20. Jesus then kills them with the sword coming out of his mouth, and the birds eat their flesh, chapter 19:21. So basically, what happens is that the Lord Jesus Christ thrusts his sickle into the earth to gather all those aligned with the Antichrist to battle him. Once gathered, Jesus comes with a sharp sword in his mouth, chapter 19, 15, and kills all those on the Antichrist's side, and the birds eat their flesh, chapter 19, 21, since their fruit is bad, being part of Satan's kingdom. Therefore, the event, here, is describing the second coming of Christ. A similar event, that may help explain this, is Israel and the Canaanites. God gave the land of Israel to Abram. However, Israel would not possess the land for 400 years, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full Genesis 15 verses 13 to 16. In other words, because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 verse 9, he waited until the Canaanites were fully given over to their wickedness, such that they would not be saved before he actually had Israel go into their land. Similarly speaking, the Lord Jesus Christ waits until man's wickedness is at its full under the Antichrist before he reaps the wicked off of the earth and destroys them. The Lord Jesus Christ then uses the same sword, the word of God, to rule the Gentiles with a rod of iron in the kingdom, chapter 19, 15. Therefore, chapters 14 and 19 are not describing two different comings or events. Chapter 14 describes the sickle used to separate out those aligned with the Antichrist from the rest of the world. They are then destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ's sword in chapter 19. The remaining people, the believing remnant of Israel, and all those who did not align themselves with the Antichrist, enter the kingdom, and the sword of chapter 19 describes the word of God, used also to rule the undecided Gentiles in the millennial kingdom. Chapter 14, 17-19 these verses go along with Matthew 13 verse 30. Jesus reaps the earth with his sharp sickle. Then, the reapers gather together the unbelievers to be burned. The fire of the tribulation period has already purified Israel, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 3. Now, we see fire coming out from the altar to burn up the unbelievers because they are impure. So, what I think we have in chapter 14 colon 14 16 is where Jesus Christ, as the righteous judge, separates the wheat from the tares, or the grapes of the vine of the earth from the grapes of the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. Then, with this distinction made, two more angels come along and actually gather up the grapes or men from the vine of the earth, and cast them, into the great winepress of the wrath of God, chapter 14 19. 
This winepress is probably symbolic of the birds coming and eating the flesh of the Antichrist's army. I think this symbolism is used to go along with the vine of the earth being destroyed as well. This vine is the one in Adam, which is Babylon. Thus, both Babylon and Babylon's people are destroyed at the same time. Meanwhile, the people, who did not get involved with the Babylonian religious system, get to enter God's kingdom as unsaved Gentiles. These Gentiles, then, get a taste of both the vine of Adam, Antichrist in the tribulation period, and the vine of the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial reign, and make their decision, as to whose side they are on, at the end of Jesus' millennial reign, chapter 20, 7-10. Therefore, the purpose of the millennial reign is for the undecideds to make up their minds. Note also that chapter 14, 17 says that another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. The people on earth are going to think that the temple that the Antichrist sits in is God's temple but it is not. God left Israel's earthly temple in Ezekiel 10 verses 18 to 19. When Christ offered the blood of his sacrifice to God, it was not offered in the holy places made with hands, but in heaven itself, Hebrews 9 verse 24. Therefore, the true temple of God is in heaven. In fact, if you really want to have your mind blown, consider the following. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Also in Christ, the body of Christ is builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2 verse 22. It is quite possible, then, that the heavenly temple that the angel comes out of in chapter 14, 17, is the body of Christ itself in heavenly places. Chapter 14, colon 20, Revelation 20, colon 4-6, says that believing Israel will rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. After the 1,000 years are over, Satan gathers up his army for a final battle, Satan loses, and the new heaven and new earth are established, chapter 21, colon 1. Since God is holy and he will dwell in Jerusalem for 1,000 years with saved Israel, Jerusalem must be holy during that time, as well. This is why all of the wicked ones in Jerusalem are reaped, and the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, chapter 1915, is trodden without the city, chapter 1920, or outside the city. Jesus reaps the earth of the wicked ones, at this time, so that he has a holy place to dwell for 1,000 years with Israel. This is why Zechariah 14 verse 11 says, Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Sin is taken outside Jerusalem and dealt with there, just like Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, or outside Jerusalem's gates, Hebrews 13 verse 12. Remember that Israel wandered in the wilderness for forty years. Remember that John the Baptist preached in the wilderness, Matthew 3 verse 1. Remember that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, Matthew 4 verse 1. Sin is dealt with in the wilderness, outside the city, so that Jerusalem may be purified for God and his people to dwell in. In this case of destroying the wicked people associated with the Antichrist, the river of blood that is the result is five feet high, the height of a horse's bridles, by 200 miles long, 1,600 furlongs. You really cannot calculate how many people are killed, because you are not given the width of the river. If you take the 200 miles as square miles, that is, length times width, the river is much too small. Therefore, it must be 200 miles long, but the width is not given to us. We have previously noted that 25% of the world is killed in the first half of the tribulation period, chapter 6, 8, and another 25% are killed in the second half of the tribulation period, chapter 9, 15 says that one third are killed. That is one-third of the people that are left. In terms of the original population, one-third of those left is one-quarter of the original population. Therefore, if the tribulation period starts with 8 billion people on the earth, and 50% of them are killed in the tribulation period, 4 billion people are left. Given that each human holds an average of 5 liters of blood, a river of blood, that is 200 miles long and 5 feet high would be one-eighth of a mile wide if it contains the blood of 4 billion people. The river could just as easily be one quarter of a mile wide and contain the blood of 8 billion people. Because we are not given the width, we cannot calculate how many people are killed, which means we cannot know when the tribulation period will start. 
However, we can say that enough people exist on the earth today for this river of blood to be a reality, which means that the rapture can take place at any moment. Chapter 15 The details of how Jesus reaps the earth and destroys the wicked on the earth are found in chapters 15 to 16. Chapter 15 shows what happens in heaven, while chapter 16 shows what happens on the earth. First, chapter 15 colon 2 dash 4 shows that the martyred, little flock is really better off than apostate Israel, as the little flock does not have to endure the seven vile judgments. Rather, eternity has already begun for them. Then, we see that the seven vile judgments are the wrath of God, poured out upon mankind, in response to the prayers of the little flock for vengeance upon their enemies, chapter 6 colon 9 dash 10. We can also view chapter 15, as the fulfillment of the curses and blessings God promised under the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 27 to 28. Unbelievers are cursed for not keeping all the words of the law, Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. This is seen in 15 colon 5 dash 8. Believers are blessed for keeping the Mosaic law because Christ kept the law for them and became a curse for them, Deuteronomy 21 verses 22 to 23. Galatians 3 verse 13. This is seen in 15 colon 1 dash 4. Chapter 15 colon 1, the details of the seven, vile judgments are given in chapter 16. We know that these seven last plagues fill up the wrath of God, chapter 15 colon 1. Then by reading the details of the judgments in chapter 16, we see that they culminate in Babylon being destroyed, chapter 16 colon 19 dash 20. Therefore, we can conclude that these seven last plagues are the detail behind the summary, found in chapter 14, 14-20, of how God will destroy the Antichrist and all those aligned with him at the end of the tribulation period. Since the evil is destroyed from off the earth, the wrath of God is filled up in the seven vile judgments. It is quite probable that the seven angels giving out these last plagues are the seven angels who minister to the seven churches of Asia to help them endure unto the end of the tribulation period and be saved chapter 2 to 3. In this way, they get to punish those who oppress the churches that they guarded. Chapter 15 colon 2 The way that the little flock gains the victory over the beast is by being killed by the beast, just like Jesus gained the victory over Satan by being killed by Satan. The reason is because death shows their faith in God to give them the victory, rather than them trying to win the victory themselves. In other words, their faith is in the spiritual realm, not in the material. Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10 verse 28. Dot. Therefore, they do not mind if they are killed in the material, since God has the resurrection power to give them eternal life in the spiritual. The type of this faith is found in the Old Testament when God did not give Abraham and Sarah the promised son, Isaac, until both of them were unable to produce a child by themselves, Romans 4 verse 19. The time of the celebration of the victory in chapter 15 to 2 is after the end of the tribulation period, when no more believers will be killed, chapter 6 to 10 dash 11. The overcomers stand on the sea of glass, chapter 15 colon 2. In chapter 4 colon 6, we learn that the sea of glass is before God's throne. It is the top to the container that is the heaven and the earth, in which we currently dwell. Therefore, when these seven plagues come upon the earth, the martyred, little flock of Israel will be safe in God's heaven, praising God for giving them the victory, because they had faith in God, rather than worshipping the beast, worshipping the image, taking the mark, or taking the number of his name. In chapter 14, we saw Jesus and the 144,000 stand on the earth as a final warning to unsaved men. Now in chapter 15, we see the believing remnant, from the great tribulation, rejoice over God's victory over Satan on earth that is about to take place. The reason that the sea of glass is mingled with fire, here, is to show that these are they, who came through the fire of the great tribulation, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4, upon whom, the fire had no power to destroy them, Daniel 3 verse 27, because the Son of God, Daniel 3 verse 25, went through the fire with them through his word and his Holy Spirit, to keep them safe. Thus, at the end, all will see that God kept his promises to faithful Israel. Note also that they have the harps of God. In chapter 14 colon 2-3, 
The 144,000 harped on their harps a new song that only the 144,000 could sing. Now in chapter 15 colon 2-3, the believing remnant sings two more songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Chapter 15 colon 3-4, the song of Moses is found in Exodus 15. Israel sung it in celebration of God bringing them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. Since this is a type of God bringing Israel out of Babylon through the fire of the Great Tribulation period, believing Israel sings the same song here. They also sing the Song of the Lamb, the words of which are given here in chapter 15 colon 3-4. Every word of the song is significant. His great and marvelous works would be everything the Lord Jesus Christ did to redeem believing Israel from being Satan's lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verse 25. This makes him Lord God Almighty. His ways would be the commandments he gave to Israel, which are just and true, to separate the believers from the unbelievers in Israel, as Hosea 14 verse 9 says, The ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Being the King of Saints chapter 15 colon 3, means that the Lord rules over them, which he does because of the victory he won over Satan by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. With that victory won, all fear the Lord and glorify his name. The reason he won the victory over Satan is because of his holiness. Adam lost against Satan because he transgressed. Jesus won against Satan because he is holy, therefore death could not hold him. Since the Lord conquered death, God will give him the Gentiles for his inheritance, Psalm 2 verses 7 to 8. You see, Psalm 2 verse 7 says that thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Acts 13 verses 33 to 34 tells us that this day refers to Jesus' resurrection day. This is vitally important because God's goal is to give everyone abundant, eternal life in his kingdom. When Jesus conquered death, this goal became a reality. Therefore, Psalm 2 verse 8 says that God gives Jesus the Gentiles because now he can give life to the Gentiles. This is why all nations come and worship before him, chapter 15 colon 4. The Gentiles also Jesus as God, due to his judgments being made manifest. That is what happens here at the end of the tribulation period with the seven vile judgments. Babylon falls, the Antichrist and his people are destroyed, Jerusalem is cleansed, and Jesus sets up God's kingdom in Jerusalem. The Gentiles recognize him as God and worship him. After all, if the whole world worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him, and Jesus successfully defeats the beast, the Gentiles would now worship Jesus. Note that all of this starts with the cross. The cross is his works chapter 15 colon 3 that redeem Israel. His ways are just and true, and so they stand forever. He is king, he is Lord, and he alone is holy. Therefore he is able to judge the whole world, and all nations worship him, as a result, chapter 15 colon 3-4. Chapter 15 colon 5, the tabernacle of testimony, is the tabernacle that God had Moses build, according to Exodus 38 verse 21. Israel carried it with them as they journeyed in the wilderness, Numbers 1 colon 50-51. Of course, this was just a pattern of the true tabernacle of testimony, which is in heaven, Exodus 25 verses 9 and 40. It is called the Tabernacle of Testimony because it contains the testimony or law covenant between God and Israel. Therefore, when the Tabernacle of the Testimony in Heaven, chapter 15, colon 5, is opened, it means that God is about to bring about the promise he made to Israel in that covenant, which is that they will dwell in the promised land on earth with God forever. You may say, but Israel had to keep the Mosaic law in order to receive that promise. Yes, that is true, but Jesus Christ kept the law for them and then became a curse for them under that law. Therefore, the blessing that Jesus Christ receives for keeping the Mosaic law is enjoyed by Israel in the kingdom. Chapter 15 colon 6 On the flip side, those on earth who have not believed the gospel have to experience the curse under the Mosaic law themselves. This is why seven angels come out of the temple with seven plagues. The wrath of God must be satisfied by purging the earth of wickedness to make it possible for redeemed Israel to dwell with God in Jerusalem and for believing Gentiles in Israel's prophetic program 
to dwell in the rest of the earth under the leadership of saved Israel. The angel's pure and white linen symbolizes righteousness, 19,8. The gold symbolizes the purity of the little flock, coming through the tribulation period, Job 23 verse 10. The idea is that, only those, who have endured unto the end of the tribulation period with faith in God, will survive the seven plagues and sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb in God's eternal kingdom on earth chapter 15 colon 3 dash 4. Chapter 15 colon 7, in chapter 5 colon 8, the golden vials, that the four beasts have, are said to contain the prayers of saints. Chapter 610 tells us that the prayers of the martyred saints, are a request to the Lord for him to judge, and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. Now, we see that the golden vials are full, not of prayers of saints, but of the wrath of God, chapter 15, colon 7. Therefore, the prayers of the saints for vengeance, upon those killing God's people, are now answered by God with the seven vials of his wrath to destroy them. God said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, Hebrews 10, verse 30. Now, we see God fulfilling that promise by destroying wickedness at the end of the tribulation period. Chapter 15, colon 8, in Exodus 40, verse 34, the glory of God entered the completed temple so that God could dwell with Israel. Now, in 15, colon 8, the glory of God enters the temple in judgment of the world, and specifically of Jerusalem, so that God can bring the temple down to the earth and dwell with Israel forever. Chapter 21, colon 2-3.